Good evening. Uh, so glad to have you on Facebook and join online for our Starting Point classes. Uh, this is environment created, especially if you are new to the faith. Uh, maybe you have uh, some Christian experience but have questions about Lutheranism. Uh, maybe for you, you've just been disconnected from uh, a church for a while. Uh, maybe this is your first church exposure. Um, the name is uh, on purpose that this would be a beginning, a starting point in your walk with God. And so I wanted to welcome you, especially if you are new or watching online. Uh, with that, I'm going to invite uh, God to be with us as we pray together. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, man, you promised that when two or three come together, there you show up in a very powerful way. Lord, I also thank you for your spirit that gives me eyes to see the beauty of Jesus, a heart that holds him as king, and hands and feet that want to live out his directives. And so help us to see the wonderful things you have for us in your word today, especially as we talk about baptism. Uh, give us insight into your word, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, as we get going here, I wanted to lay the ground rules, as always. Uh, one is that we would have fun. I am convinced as a pastor that your very best moments should not be watching uh, football games, whether it be Pairs or Packers, uh, should not be watching Cubs or Sox. Your very best moments, I believe, should be in church. If you have the right to be called God's child, if Jesus won a victory for you, then there should be nothing better than dwelling in his word and, and being caught by all of his promises. So I hope this is fun for you. Another thing is that whenever you have questions, uh, feel free to uh, put them online and, uh, and, and we'd be happy to uh, answer whatever comes to your mind. We like going off topic as well, so uh, we believe in teachable moments. If you have anything, spiritual concerns, uh, this is a place to get an honest answer uh, from the Bible um, as a pastor. Uh, ask whenever you want to. Obviously, uh, because you're at home, these two apply. Uh, <laughs> you can uh, do whatever you want at home. No one can see you. Maybe you're eating supper. Maybe you have this, you know, in the background. And, uh, and we're just so glad to share these moments with you. Um, so thanks for being with us. Uh, with that, we love to get to know one another through discussion questions. And uh, my one discussion question for tonight is this. What is a favorite restaurant of yours or a favorite pizza place? I'm going to hone in, especially on that second one. What is your favorite pizza place? Now, I know being in the area, Aurelio's is a huge, huge deal. It was the first place that was, uh, you know, our family went to, taken by some members. Um, we heard about this original oven in Homewood. Um, and, and Aurelio's is a, a great, great choice uh, if you've been in the south suburbs of Chicago. But for me, I, I got to say that I go back to classic childhood memories. And for me, there was this program called Book It, where if you read a book, you got this personal pizza. And so maybe you know where I'm going with this. Pizza Hut, baby. I love me some personal pan pizza. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. That, that pan style, Pizza Hut does it so well. Um, I'll be probably loving Pizza Hut till the day I die, if I can still eat it. Um, Nadia says Panda Express. Yes, Nadia, orange chicken. How can you go wrong with orange chicken? Uh, you know, sometimes I dream that heaven is just filled with food, and like maybe you can just continue to eat orange chicken, never get full, never get unhealthy. Uh, may maybe that's what it's like, Nadia. Um, all right, well, I don't know what it is for you, but, uh, but so, so great to... Um, uh, you know, consider one of the blessings of life, which is food. And uh, I wanted to say hi to Mary Shar. Uh, Mary, a happy belated birthday. I saw that online, I believe, and, uh, and hope you are doing well in Colorado. Uh, so we are going to get into our lesson for tonight. And uh, so excited to talk about our topic, which is baptism. And one of the things I know is that uh, at various points in life, we need a fresh start. Uh, for example, I thought that COVID-19 was going to end, you know, in April. And so when May came around and I realized this is a whole new month, I looked at May as kind of this new start, this new beginning. Um, there were things that I really wanted to hone in on. 
that before I was just, you know, playing around with working out at home, I really had to, like, solve that issue and start working out. Um, before, you know, I was playing around with my schedule, I really needed to get a, a hold on this new schedule. I, I, and so May, for me, became a new beginning and a fresh start. I don't know for you, uh, you know, natural times are the new year. And, and so sometimes, you know, we have these New Year resolutions because we look at what we did in the past and we look forward and we say, man, I'm going to begin again. Um, a move can often do this. If you've ever moved out of state or to a new home, it can snap things. I, I have a fresh start, you know, uh, new people, new surroundings, and, and, and here we go, uh, right? Something I love about being in the Lord is that no matter what happened today or yesterday or the day before, because of mercies that are new every morning, we have opportunity for a new beginning. Today is a new beginning. Tomorrow is a new beginning. You don't have to be or do what you were before. There are fresh starts possible in our Lord. In fact, as a believer, what we know is that we have the power of the risen Christ at work in us. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, uh, the New Testament would say, is, is alive in us. And if we have resurrection power, what can't we do? What change can't we make? Um, I, I consider those who uh, have chewed off many different goals in their lives and, and accomplished them, whether it be running a marathon or doing CrossFit or, or, or whatever, um, or, or accomplishing a master's degree. It's possible um, through the risen Christ, along with our character increasing. And something I love about baptism is because it can be a fresh start. One of the greatest sections about what we'll talk about is from Titus chapter 3, where it says that baptism is a washing of rebirth and renewal. So you are either reborn, uh, which I believe happened to me when I was baptized as an infant. I was a dead thing that God made alive through the water and the word. Or it can be renewed. And, and we had some adult baptisms, uh, and, and the comments were, man, this was really, really powerful for me. Um, you know, there was this refreshment going on. They felt that uh, from the Spirit. Baptism is one of the greatest gifts that our God has for us. A reminder that he chose us by grace, that salvation has nothing to do with what we did. Because before we could choose him, he chose us and made us alive. And so we talk about it. And may God bless the discussion of baptism. Now, the first thing I wanted to define is what a sacrament is. Uh, and I know different churches define sacrament very differently. Um, and if you are in the Lutheran faith, uh, here is how we define a sacrament. The, the first part of a sacrament is is that it is instituted by Jesus. Um, instituted or begun by Jesus. And we saw that at his baptism. Um, he went to uh, John, uh, who was known for baptizing, uh, his disciple, his, his forerunner, his front runner. And when John met him, he's like, you know, um, <laughs> uh, Jesus, you don't need this, and, and I should be baptized by you. But Jesus says, no, 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 you, you may not understand, but... I must be baptized. And it's there when the Father gave approval. This is my Son, whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. There when we saw the picture of the Holy Spirit coming down and sitting upon Jesus as a dove. Um, and, and so if Jesus was baptized, um, we also should be baptized. What's really interesting is that the New Testament makes a difference between John's baptism and Jesus' baptism. And some believe that John's baptism was just symbolic and one for repentance, whereas Jesus' baptism was a spirit baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, some say. Uh, we don't need to be too concerned about John's baptism because uh, we live in the New Testament era. Since Jesus, we know what this is, uh, but just interesting. But it was begun by Jesus. And, and so a sacrament, uh, we also saw that with communion, he is in the upper room instituting um, that sacrament as well. Then, there is an earthly element involved. Uh, with communion, uh, we know that it was uh, wine and it was unleavened bread. Um, and so that's what we still use uh, today. Why do we have that wafer bread? Because that's what Jesus was using. Uh, why do we usually use wine? Um, 
that's what Jesus was using. We can use grape juice. It's not too far away. Uh, he refers to the fruit of the vine. Uh, but that's the earthly element in communion. In baptism, you might know, what do we need? Water. Just water. And then finally, um, what it does is it increases our faith. Um, and so it's a faith strengthener. That's why we love uh, God's word. Faith comes from hearing the message and the message is the word of Christ. We love the word. And that's why we also love the sacraments because uh, they are, are what make us strong. They are spiritual workouts. The reason we say it increases faith is because both the Lord's Supper and, as we'll see, baptism provide the forgiveness of sins. Uh, Jesus said, take and eat uh, body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. Um, in in baptism, we'll see again the washing of rebirth and renewal, um, where again, uh, Paul recounts his own baptism where, where he was told, get baptized and wash away your sins. Um, we'll see that as well. So whenever your sins are forgiven, your faith increases. But that's a definition of a sacrament. All right. Well, let's get into it, and let's see uh, what else is going on. In Matthew 28, we have the Great Commission. And it's interesting because if you are in the church, uh, you know this is the church's marching orders. Uh, it's the mission statement of any good church is Matthew 28. And what's really interesting is that we see in the Great Commission not only the emphasis for baptism, but the words that we use in baptism. So, so here it is once again. Then Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, this is part of the mission, in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we call the Trinitarian formula, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And those are the words that make up baptism and what make it so, so powerful. And so if you've been to a baptism, you've probably heard that. You've seen some water and you've heard, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you would change that formula, uh, let's say I, I baptize you in the name of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. Um, those are interesting characters, but that's not baptism. It has to be in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when, when that is done, no matter what church you are in, um, using those words, that is baptism. Now, what is it? It's so powerful. Uh, in Romans, we, we heard, you know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And we believe this is the power of God waking up uh, dead people, bringing dead people to life um, for now and forever. In Ephesians, um, when, when Paul is talking about this relationship between husband and wife, um, which makes sense to me today, today's our 15-year anniversary, um, when Paul is talking about this, uh, he, he refers also to the gift of baptism. Uh, look here, it says, Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, cleansing her with the washing of water through the word. So water and the word. And that, my friends, is baptism. The word, which we talked about, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and water. And when you combine those things, you have baptism. And it's simple. It doesn't take very long. The words are not numerous. But it's profound. And I love in the simplicity of what God created that it's so accessible for all people. Uh, you know, all you need is these words and then also water, and you can find water almost anywhere. What I'm so thankful is that he did not require this. Um, if you remember the movie Avatar, uh, this was called Unobtainium, and they had to move the blue people away from the Unobtainium because it was so rare. It reminds me of plutonium, um, you know, what they use for nuclear devices. Um, it reminds me of diamonds. They're so precious. They're so rare. I'm so glad that when God gives this great gift, he uses an element that is so accessible. You can be almost anywhere. It doesn't even need to be clean water and find water to be baptized. I remember the Ethiopian eunuch who said, you know, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And they paused and they did that baptism because there was water so accessible. 
Now, another question we have in the notes is this. Is there a special way the water needs to be applied? And, and what's kind of behind this is that some churches insist on immersion. That unless you fully are dunked under, it is not a valid baptism. Now, we don't find any proof in Scripture for immersion. In fact, uh, my background is Greek, and you can look up in a Greek dictionary the word baptizo. That's the Greek word where, obviously, we get baptism. And under the definitions, you can find one definition as immerse. That's fine. But you can also find the definitions to sprinkle or to wash, um, which are, are just as valid. In fact, that same Greek word was talked about in the cleaning of kettles and cups and pitchers, uh, ceremonial cleanings that, that were, again, not just fully immersed, but just washed. And, and so you, you don't need to be immersed to have a valid baptism. Now, that was confirmed not only from my Greek background, but then also to my trip to the Holy Land. When I was in Israel, I saw a baptistry that dated back to the 100s A.D. I think it was two or 300 A.D. And I know you can't tell the scale here, uh, but it's basically two bowls put together. Two bowls put together, and this was their baptistry. And for those insisting that traditionally they always did immersion, um, this church would nullify that regard. It's the same thing I saw in uh, Ukraine when I went to uh, a church that dated to the 1500s. Their baptistry was something you could stand in, but it wasn't a pool where you'd be immersed in. Finally, the Jordan River. Um, I saw the Jordan River, and parts of it in Israel looked like a creek. It came up to your shins. Now, granted, I don't know how the ecological system has changed since the time of Jesus, but if that's true, you know, that it, it just came up to the shins, those insisting that when Jesus went down into the Jordan, came up, we don't know if he fully got immersed, even through that language, which I've also studied in the Greek. Uh, when it says go down and come up, there, there is no indication that this was immersion um, as much as going into a river and coming out of that river. Uh, I might be losing some of you and might say, well, what's the big deal? Uh, part of it is, is, is some people will say you have to be baptized again because you didn't do it right. And, and so they'll insist on immersion or they'll insist that you get baptized in their church. And I just want to clarify that if at any church you received water and, and it was applied to you in whatever fashion, and they said in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have had a valid baptism. Because it doesn't matter how the water was applied. And it also doesn't matter who conducted it. The power didn't come from the priest, from the pastor, from the church body. The power came from God who promised to use water and word in a very powerful way. So I hope that uh, clarifies uh, the concern of immersion. Uh, if there are any questions, please let me know. Another big clarification is that some would say your baptism is what you do for God. This is how you become public. This is how you say you follow Jesus. So some would say this is what you do for God. But in the, the next part of this discussion, I want to just clarify that this is what he is doing for us. It is his gift. So let's go to Pentecost. Uh, Peter was talking to all that had gathered a big crowd and said, you know, you killed Jesus. You should say you're sorry and repent. And, and after this, this climactic sermon, uh, here were the words. Peter replied, so repent and be baptized, every one of you, so everyone should be baptized, young and old, we'll talk about that later, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter is saying, when you are baptized, guess what you're going to receive? Forgiveness of sins. God wants to give you a gift. And also the Holy Spirit through faith. How amazing. Now, Paul, he remembers his baptism in Acts 22. And as he's recounting it to uh, some authorities, this is what he had heard God say. He said, get up, be baptized, wash your sins away. And, and that was so, so clear, you know, uh, that you wash your sins away through baptism. And then finally, Galatians 3, all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So the first blessing we receive in 
in baptism is forgiveness of sins. And, and that's so clear. Get up, wash your sins away, repent to be baptized for forgiveness of sins, clothed with Christ. Now let's talk about some fun imagery. You know, I think of the, the glory of uh, right now washing cars. It's, it's springtime in Chicago, and so it's, it's good to make that car shine. And, and you know what it is to take it to fullers in our area or to get out the hose in a bucket and, and get the dirt off. Well, God is saying you had some dirt, you had some sin, and through baptism you come through this clean. Another picture he had for us is that we're clothed with Christ. Now, what does it mean to be clothed with Christ? This reminds us of a bride's wedding day. Let me ask you, what color does a bride wear on her wedding day? She wears white. And white is a symbol of purity, of cleanliness. And so when God is saying, you know, uh, you were baptized, we're clothed with Christ, he's saying through baptism we now receive his righteousness. We also are, are, are perfect and holy in God's sight. And again, that connection to baptism, not just to faith. How awesome. So again, the blessing of forgiveness comes. What, what, what next? Well, here I wanted to share with you maybe my favorite section of Scripture on baptism. Titus chapter 3. I'm going to read this whole section, and then we're going to talk about it. It says, But when the kindness and love of our, our God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. Now, that's so important to clarify. Again and again, it tells us we're not saved by being good. We're saved by the grace and mercy of God. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. What happens? We receive a washing of rebirth and renewal. And the result is that we're heirs of eternal life. Another way of thinking of this is that on a birthday, we celebrate how a child became part of someone's family. On a baptism day, we can rightly celebrate how a child becomes part of God's family and heir of the kingdom. And by this, I don't mean to say, be baptized and that's all you need to do with your faith. No, you still need to walk in the faith and pursue the Lord. But he brings us in. He makes a dead thing alive simply through these waters. What's also interesting is this uh, conversation that Nicodemus and Jesus had over baptism. And, and Jesus was basically saying, you know, you need to be reborn, Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was like, I can't re-enter my mother's womb. And Jesus was like, I'm, I'm not talking about an earthly birth. I'm talking about a spiritual one. And then he went on to say how, just how important baptism is. In John chapter 3, it says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, and the Spirit gives birth to the Spirit. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Wow, those are big words. Now let me ask you my trick question. Can you go to heaven without being baptized? What do you think? Can you get to heaven without being baptized? The answer is yes. All right, now back up that example with it, or back up that answer with an example. For me, the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross who had you know, made fun of Jesus and says, now he turned to him, remember me when you get to your kingdom. What did Jesus turn back and say to him? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. And so he had the faith in Jesus that saves, and so he was going to be with the Lord. Now, he, he wasn't baptized, but he's still going there. Um, now, with that, if he had still kept living, would Jesus want him to be baptized? I do believe so. Uh, but faith, again, in Jesus is what saves. But what I see in this section, John chapter 3, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water in the Spirit, is, is the desire for all to receive this. When it comes to the gift of baptism, Christians shouldn't approach it by saying, well, you know what, if I get around to it, you know, well, whatever, you know, I guess I could do this or not do this. No, God says do this. Be baptized. Get your kids baptized. Be baptized if you have not. This is the gift that I want to give you. So very important. So the washing of rebirth and renewal, what does that mean? It's just being born again. 
And, uh, you know, just as we celebrate a birthday, what you could also do is celebrate a baptism day as how, you know, God was bringing that child into the kingdom. Um, I love my daughter's room, and she has a picture, Nadia, of her baptism day. Um, that's a great remembrance of what God did for her. All right, final thought on the gift of God through baptism. 1 Peter 3, these are interesting words. It says, the water symbolizes baptism that saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a good conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he's linking our baptism to salvation, which is in incredible. It reminds me of Mark 16, 16. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Now, Jesus saved us, right? But baptism is a way of receiving those great benefits and gifts, uh, forgiveness, life, and salvation. So as we conclude this section... We heard that we receive forgiveness of sins. It's a washing of rebirth and renewal. We're reborn. Um, we heard that we're heirs of the kingdom. We've come into God's family. And we heard that we're saved, which are all ways of saying God wants to give you a great gift in baptism. Do it. But perhaps the question I get the most often as a Lutheran pastor is, is this really for children? And how do we know? And so I think it's good to clarify that as well. And to begin that discussion, we have to take it back to the Great Commission. When, when Jesus gave the command to go and make disciples, look at those words once again. He said, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So who does he say to make disciples and to baptize of? He says, all. Now, what does all mean? <laughs> if I said that all of us, you know, watching online were going to Wrigley Field when this is all done, how many does that exclude? Sox fans? No. They're, you can come too. All means all. And so sometimes as a pastor, I get the question, you know, uh, pastor, would you show me the passage where it says to baptize children? You know. And I don't like to be snarky, but I guess I could, because I could return and I could say, well, Where's the passage that says to baptize teenagers? Where's the passage that says to baptize senior citizens? Where's the passage that says to baptize 40-year-olds or couples? Um, there's none. They don't draw out specifics. You, you know what it does say, though? It says all. And all means all. So they're included. So not only that, but then as we continue this, they're included in the command, we see their spiritual need. Now, how many of you have children? Let me ask you a question. Did you ever teach your children how to be naughty? Did you ever teach them how not to share? Like you had this sit-down moment, and, and you just grab it, and you say, mine, and you throw a fit, and that's what works. Did you ever have that lesson? When they were teenagers, did you have this lesson on attitude. Now, if you really want to make mom and dad mad, here's how to roll your eyes. Here's the tone of voice. Here's how you do dead face. You didn't have those lessons? Me neither. Okay, next question. Have your kids done those things? Yeah, <laughs> they have. Why? Because they're made like us. And what's very clear is that our kids are cute, uh, our kids are a great gift from God, but they are way sinful. <laughs> what does it say in Psalm 51? Surely I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Uh, we all are, and our kids are natural born rebels. Uh, we don't want to please God. And, and John 3, 6 uh, reminds us how this came. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. And, and so what we find is this. Uh, that from birth, um, we, we want to do what is wrong, and the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. We, we pass along good traits, but also some rebellious ones, and, and, and that's the, the state of things. And so because they are sinful, they have need of forgiveness and a spiritual life. Now, now that isn't what all believe. Some believe in the age of accountability, that for a certain time, as long as they are young, and maybe when they reach 8th grade or ninth grade, they become accountable to God. But before that time, their sins and their naughtiness is, is not really something that he holds against them. Let's have a discussion on earthly things. 
when it comes to the laws of this land, if you're ignorant of the law, does that mean you're innocent? <laughs> Tell you a story. I remember I was uh, having some holy moments driving to church in Crete, and I was new in the area. I was listening to a sermon on my way to listen to a sermon, but I, I didn't see where the speed limit sign changed. It changed from 45 to 35 on the way into Crete, and I was at 50, so I was still wrong. But um, when the police officer pulled me over in my holy moment of preparing for a sermon and listening to a sermon, and I was rocking 50 and a 35, did he care that I didn't see the sign? Did my ignorance mean I was innocent? And so our kids, do, do they always know what they're doing is breaking God's law? No, no, they don't. But does that mean that they're innocent? No, it doesn't. And they need also the same forgiveness that we do. Um, so again, I, I don't see that we're accountable at a later stage in life because we didn't know. Uh, we, we've always been accountable for sin regardless, which is why this gift of baptism to cover all of our sin um, is so amazing. So with that, when... when when we're sinners, how does this make us with a holy God? Does sin make us his friend? Does it make us neutral to him? Or does it make us a rebel who wants to do other things? Sin makes us a rebel. Romans says that the sinful mind is hostile to God. It doesn't want to obey. So we need a gift. All right, so they're included in all. They're sinful. Here's another thing. Matthew 18 says, If anyone causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, and it goes on, but he's basically saying these little ones, they believe. And, and the classic picture of Jesus with the kids is when the disciples were saying, you know what, kids, go away, shoo, shoo. Jesus is a busy man, important people are around him, he doesn't have time for you. And what does Jesus say? Luke 18, people were bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. And when the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the little children and said, Let the little children come to them. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God, God belongs to such as these. So the final thing is that we know kids have a faith life. In fact, one of the, the greatest things to observe is the faith life of our kids. You know, it was just yesterday I was in the same building taping the confirmation essays uh, for the confirmands this year. Eighth graders who are going to share in a beautiful way what grace is and who Jesus is and what God means to them. And just amazing. One of my favorite things to do is to go to a chapel service and to hear those kids singing and sing with them. At Good Shepherd, at Trinity Lutheran, man, those are my favorite moments where these little ones are telling me about my wonderful God, where they're, they're being part of the universal priesthood, proclaiming the praises of him who called us out of darkness into the wonderful light. This is just an amazing thing. You can be inspired by the faith that God gave our little ones. In fact, God even says, um, we should have a childlike faith. A faith that hears what God has said and simply takes hold of it and believes it. So, uh, our children included in, in this command to baptize, I hope you've seen why. They're included in all, they have the spiritual need, and they definitely have a very active faith life. And so one of the things I, I love to do is to um, welcome new families with their children and, and make sure that they receive the grace of God right away. All right. So, with that, a question. Uh, nowhere in Scripture does God command an exact time to baptize a child. But considering the blessings that are received in the sacrament, when would you suggest the timing of a child's baptism? Wh when would you say you should baptize? You, you know what many people through the Spirit have said collectively? As soon as possible, basically. Um, some like it right in the hospital, and that's fine. Um, you know, that as soon as that baby enters, uh, they're going to receive the grace of God. Some who have, you know, children without any health concerns uh, like to celebrate as a church family, and so they wait a month and, and they plan when, when grandmas and grandpas can get together and, and the church can celebrate together. That, that, that's neat, too. Uh, there's, there's, there's freedom there. 
Uh, but if, if, let's say, someone heard this lesson and, and they had a child who wasn't baptized, and they're like, well, let's just, you know, get around to it when I can. Or, or let's say you're watching and you haven't been baptized, and you're like, well, you know what, it doesn't matter too much. I, I think we've missed something. You know, uh, God does want us to receive this gift. As a parent, one of the things I consider is if Jesus came back and he had this gift for my kid and, and I didn't give it to him, what answer would I have? Why didn't you baptize? Right? So as soon as possible. Could you baptize? That's an interesting question. And the answer is yes. You could baptize another person. In fact, it, let's say you're in the hospital and there's no pastor around to conduct the baptism, can't get to the hospital. What you would do is you would take water and you would apply that water usually on the head and say in the name of the Father, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and that is baptism. Um, that's how you can give the gift of God to someone. Now, why do pastors usually do the baptism? So we can teach. So we can teach those who are baptized what is going on, so it's not some mystical moment where, you know, we, we don't know what God is doing. And we, we do it in the church with a pastor so that that same pastor can encourage the ongoing faith life. For, for hear me clearly, um, you can be baptized and still fall from the faith. The faith that was created, unfortunately, can um, dissipate uh, as we don't, you know, use our faith or hear the word. Uh, so, so it's good to be baptized um, for that matter, married in the church where your faith is going to continue. That's the way faith works. It needs ongoing uh, sustenance. What about sponsors and witnesses? Um, sponsors and witnesses are, are just fine. Uh, they are church tradition, though. They are not biblical mandate. And so in church tradition, the way you do it is you think of people in your family who will pray uh, for that child, who will encourage them to continue through their lives um, to stay close to the Lord. Um, in my life, I actually had a sponsor who, like, was gold star, the best sponsor ever. His name is Dale Marquardt. And, I mean, through every season of life, eighth grade graduation, high school, college, seminary graduation, he was encouraging my faith life by sending um, spiritual materials, uh, by being at first, one of my first presentations when I got out to be a pastor, Dale Marquardt has, like, you know, the, the highest level sponsor that I have ever witnessed in, in what he did to encourage me in the faith. Uh, thank you, Dale. And then, um, you know, another consideration is, um, you know, uh, other children. You know, uh, the, the question in the notes is, what happens to a child who dies and is not baptized? And uh, we live in an era where there are many more miscarriages. And, man, my heart breaks um, for those who have, have gone through that. Um, and, and I just uh, defer, even though the Bible is silent, I defer to God's mercy and compassion. Uh, God came into the world to save the world, not to condemn it. Um, and so um, the Bible is uh, relatively silent. Uh, one case, though, is David. Uh, if you know uh, his sin with Bathsheba, uh, the son that she was pregnant with, they lost as a consequence for that sin. And in 2 Samuel 12, 23, uh, David talks about going to him, uh, you know, in heaven at, in the afterlife. Uh, but, but this is an area um, that there is uh, pretty much biblical silence on in general. Uh, we defer to God's mercy and compassion. All right. So hopefully you saw the grace of God in baptism. How wonderful that when we were dead in our sins, he made us alive through Christ. He created this washing of rebirth and renewal. It confirms again his love, his unconditional love that he chose us when we couldn't. May you see a God's grace in baptism for your own life. Um, let me close with a prayer. Lord, I, I thank you um, for back on Easter 1982, you brought me into the family uh, through uh, our, our church family, through the waters of baptism. Um, I thank you for the grace that has sustained me so far to hold on to my Savior, Jesus. I pray for all who are baptized that they would remember their baptism with fondness and remember it as, as your grace. Uh, continue to show your grace to those who are baptized until we meet you again in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.
All right. So this concludes our lesson on baptism. Um, I'm so thankful that you were able to join us today. Um, I'm also going to, as we close, show you a video of a man's life who was changed by the power of the gospel. Um, and, and so I wanted to share with you the story of Wayne Huzinga from Blockbuster Video back in the day. Um, I, I think he gives a great testimony of how God just changed his life, gave him a fresh start, uh, baptism was included, and, um, and, and, and just a wonderful testimony that fresh starts are possible. Uh, so we'll close today uh, by watching this video. God bless, and we'll see you next week. I wanted to be like my father. I wanted to have a nice car like he had a private jet to, to fly on when we went on vacation. I wanted to be able to bless people like he did. I wanted to be respected like he was. Uh, I saw my father occasionally. He was busy building waste management at the time. His life was uh, filled with hard work travel with interesting people. He had a certain amount of power. It was a life that, that seemed exciting to me. I made an incredible amount of money working with Wayne Sr. there. I began to have wealth to fly, to have a nice sport fishing yacht, to live in a big home, to have an incredible amount of disposable income sports teams and drank and drank in excess and went to the kind of clubs that you didn't tell your mother that you went to. I commanded an audience. I said whatever came to my mind, whether it was to you or to your wife, self-focused. Do what I want and I'm going to please me no matter what that means. That was my life. An incredible banquet of all the things that the world had to offer, but just never getting full, never being satisfied, never being able to push away and say, okay, that's enough. Suddenly I was lost, happy, but unfulfilled. Something was missing. Well, I got a call from a couple friends and they said, hey, Junior, we got a chance to go on a nuclear submarine for three days and cruise from South Carolina to Florida. Do you want to go? I said, done, we're there, we'll take our plane. And I was introduced to Captain Brad Fleetwood McDonald. We became incredible friends. He took me on his submarine, so I started taking him out of my fishing boat, and I began to ask him questions about leadership. I thought, who better than a man that commands 120 gentlemen underneath the ocean for six months at a time. And every time I asked him about leadership, he had his Bible. And he had this incredible peace about him that was unlike any that I'd ever seen in all the people that I had met through Wayne Sr. And one day I got up my courage and I asked him, I said, you know, Captain Brad, why are we so different? Junior, he said, you have a hole in your heart. It's consuming everything that you're trying to put in. Everything you do is trying to fill that hole. And the only way you're going to fill that hole is with a relationship with God. I thought, could that be it? Could it be that easy? All these things that I've been chasing, all these places that I'm going, a relationship with God. Well, I went home and I tried to find a church. pastor gave an incredible sermon and at the end before he closed said do you think that there's a reason that God allowed you to be born do you think that he has a plan for your life I felt like he was talking right at me instead of the 4,000 people that were there I stood up out of my chair like I was launched out by springs and I can still hear this voice inside of me that said junior Sit down, you look so silly. But there was no way. I made my way to the, down the road to the aisle and forward to the front of this church that I'd never been to before, and I fell to my knees. And I began to cry. And I cried, and I 
listen to that pastor and he said repeat the simple words and ask Jesus in your heart and I did I told Jesus that I was sorry that I loved him and that I wanted to know what this plan for my life was I wanted to be in this personal relationship with him if he wanted to be in it with me it's power not Junior's power but God's power the Holy Spirit's power the power to change I went home and I tried to explain to my wife what happened she looked at me and she said I don't know what happened but I'm worried she told me at one point that I'd been abducted by aliens I didn't know what to tell her all I knew is that I was indeed a different person success for me is that one day when I die and I see Jesus that he'll look at me and say well done my good and faithful son I've been given such a gift based on the life that I lived a second chance a chance to follow Jesus to go to heaven to live an eternal life and I know for certain that I'm going to live in heaven my father is the kind of individual that keeps his feelings very close but I wasn't sure that he had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and I got up the courage finally to lean over to my father and to ask him, hey dad, have you ever prayed a prayer like that to ask Jesus into your heart? Yeah, I have. Success is knowing that those that you love will make heaven. That's true success. I'm Wayne Heisinger Jr. I am second.